With over 10 crore people living with diabetes and another 13 to 14 crores with pre-diabetes, India is now called the diabetes capital of the world. One in every five people with diabetes globally is Indian. That's a massive portion of our population. So clearly, something we are doing as individuals and as a society is not working. Hello, this is Trilok, I'm a dietitian and in this video, we are going to break down what's really driving this epidemic, especially type 2 diabetes. And more importantly, how you can reclaim your health and stop diabetes from controlling your life. Okay, what is diabetes? It is a condition where your blood glucose levels are higher than normal, which can cause damage to blood vessels throughout the body. It affects your eyes, heart, kidneys, your nerves and even the gut in the long term. Glucose is the primary source of energy for us. Every cell in our body runs on it. We all know insulin is the hormone that helps glucose enter the cell. If your body cannot make insulin, it is called type 1 diabetes. The only treatment is to take external insulin. But nearly 90% of the diabetics have type 2 diabetes, where your body makes insulin, but the insulin fails to do its job. Why does that happen? Before we go to the core of the issue, here is a surprising fact. Most of your organs like the brain, liver, kidneys and the skin do not need insulin's help to take up glucose. Only your muscles and the adipose tissue are dependent on insulin. Normally, after a meal, your body stores glucose as glycogen for later use. Around 100 grams is stored in the liver and about 400 to 500 grams in the muscles. But here is the catch. Muscle glycogen is not shared with the rest of the body. So between meals, or during fasting or while you are sleeping, your liver becomes the primary source of glucose, releasing small amounts into the blood to keep everything running smoothly. So what goes wrong in type 2 diabetes? You are said to have diabetes if your fasting blood glucose is 120 or more, or your post-meal glucose is 200 or more. A more accurate measure is the HbA1c, which reflects your average blood glucose levels over 3 months. Anything below 5.7 is considered normal. 5.7 to 6.4 is pre-diabetes. Anything higher than 6.5 is considered diabetes. Let's talk about the liver and insulin. In a healthy state, after you eat a meal, insulin tells the liver, okay, stop releasing glucose now. There is enough coming from the food and it's time to store some of it. But when the liver is filled with fat, it doesn't respond properly to insulin signals. This is called insulin resistance in the liver and your liver continues to release glucose whether you have eaten or not. That's why the fasting glucose stays high. Now let's see what happens in the muscles. Skeletal muscles store about 2000 calories of glucose, but glucose can enter only through doors called insulin receptors and insulin is the key. When fat builds up inside the muscle cells, the insulin receptors in the muscles also become insulin resistant. So they cannot absorb glucose properly and glucose is now stranded in the blood. Your pancreas tries to overcome this insulin resistance by making more insulin. That's why along with fasting blood sugar and HbA1c, you should check for fasting insulin too. If it's high, you have got insulin resistance. And here is an important point. Many people have insulin resistance for years before they are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So if your HbA1c is less than 5.7, you might say, I don't have diabetes. But in the background, your pancreas might be working two to three times harder just to keep the blood glucose levels low. So just don't rely on sugar levels. Do fasting insulin tests too to confirm if you have insulin resistance. Now you might ask, if obesity causes diabetes, then how come we see some obese individuals who are not diabetic? Well, this is because each person has a different capacity to store fat safely. Some individuals would be able to store large amounts of fat under the skin before it starts spilling into the abdominal organs. Always remember, it's the visceral fat, the fat around your organs that causes insulin resistance, not the subcutaneous fat that is under the skin. For some people, like most Indians, do not have enough storage under the skin they start accumulating visceral fat very early. This is called personal fat threshold. 
Once that personal fat threshold is exceeded, the fat begins to invade the organs and cause damage, leading to insulin resistance and other metabolic issues. Let me give you an example. Person A with low personal fat threshold gets visceral fat much earlier, develops insulin resistance even at BMI is 23 to 25, looks thin but has fat in the abdominal area. Person B with a higher personal fat threshold can store more fat safely under the skin. They may be healthy even at BMI is 30 to 35. So basically they're obese but metabolically healthy. Type 2 diabetes is usually managed with medications. Some reduce glucose absorption from food while others make pancreas release more insulin. Some medications improve insulin sensitivity. But here is the problem. If you don't address the root cause, which is the visceral fat and insulin resistance, you might need higher doses and more medication over time. Eventually, your pancreas may wear out. That's when insulin therapy is added. But here is the good news. For majority of type 2 diabetics, the most powerful intervention is fat loss, especially the visceral fat. If you lose fat to a point where insulin resistance disappears, the glucose levels normalize even without medications. But remember, you should make changes to medications only under your doctor's supervision. Now, as a dietitian, I want to give you a 10-step plan to reduce fat and reverse insulin resistance. Avoid fried foods, cheese, mayonnaise, cream, margarine, snack foods like chips, french fries, instant noodles, also fat-dense items like avocados, olives, butter and nut butters. Very minimal oil usage. Avoid peanuts, cashews and groundnuts. Limit almonds to 5 a day and walnuts 2 a day. Among seeds, flax seeds, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds and sesame seeds are recommended. Choose non-starchy fruits but in moderation like berries, citrus fruits, pear, peaches, lemon, Indian gooseberry, amla. Avoid refined carbs, bread, sugar, bakery items, sweets, sugary drinks. When it comes to cereal grains, millets, quinoa, steel cut oats are the best. In small portions, brown rice is fine and ragi, especially in the sprouted form, is very healthy. Coming to vegetables, prefer non-starchy varieties. All gods are fine, leafy greens are fine, all pots and beans are good. Other vegetables such as okra, cauliflower, broccoli, capsicum, tomatoes and mushrooms are fine. Avoid starchy vegetables such as potatoes, sweet potatoes and yams. Now here comes the main part. You have to replace one meal with a non-starchy vegetable salad along with 10 grams of protein. You can have 3 to 5 varieties of boiled or steamed vegetables from this list. Carrots and cucumber you can have raw. For enhanced weight loss, replace two meals instead of one with a non-starchy vegetable salad plus 10 to 15 grams of protein at each meal. For people whose creatinine is higher than 1.3, please consult your doctor or dietitian to plan a diet with moderate protein, low sodium, low potassium and low phosphorus. Consume foods rich in chromium, magnesium and zinc. These three minerals are extremely important in diabetes. Plan a 40 minutes brisk walk every day. Strength training or resistance training is super important. You can do standing groves, standing chest press, half squats. If your knees are bad, you can do seated leg extensions with a resistance band. And calf raises. Do these exercises on alternate days. Stress management is very important. Practice daily meditation if possible and do breathing exercises. Aim for 7 to 8 hours of quality sleep and limit your screen time. If this video gave you more clarity about type 2 diabetes and how to protect yourself or your loved ones from it, please give it a like. Share it with someone who needs to hear this. And don't forget to subscribe for more practical science-backed health advice. Thank you for watching Nutritional Perspective. I'll see you in the next video.